God calls all people to live in obedience to Him. Welcome to Tony Brew Ministries. This is a Bible teaching session from the book of Jeremiah, chapters 8 and 31. The title is Sin, Punishment, and Promised Restoration. Sounds like a loaded title, and we're in store for God's Word. Sin, Punishment, and Promised Restoration. Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 33. This shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. This passage is quoted again in the book of Hebrews and that tells us it's mighty important. It was stated in the Old Testament in Jeremiah and is fulfilled in the New Testament, the new covenant of mercy, love, and grace in which we're now so blessed to be a part of is the covenant that God was talking about. God tells Jeremiah to be faithful to prophesy, even though chances were that nobody would be listening to him. They would listen that is, they would hear audibly, but they would not listen to what he had to say. God's word was rejected. Chapter 8, verse 4. Moreover, thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord, Shall they fall and not arise? Shall he turn away and not return? The obvious thing is that if you fall down, you're going to try to get back up. If you go away somewhere, you're going to try to return. Then the question is, why then is this people of Jerusalem slidden back by a perpetual backsliding? Backsliding was a practice of Israel in the Old Testament. Backsliding is an Old Testament word. It should not be in the New Testament at all, even though, of course, it's possible for people to backslide and you can come back to God if you're a backslider. Today, if you are, I encourage you to make amends and make your calling and election sure. Come back to the Lord who bought you, the one who loved you and died for you. He still loves you. And He'll take you back if you come back to Him today. Seek the Lord while He may be found. Call upon Him while He is near. Do not continue to stay away. Do not harden your heart away from God. Come back to the Lord now while you have the opportunity to do so. Why is this people of Jerusalem slidden back by a perpetual backsliding? They hold fast deceit. They refuse to return. God says, I've sent my prophets rising up early and speaking to you, and yet you will not hear what I had to say. You will not come to me. You will not allow me to heal your heart and to mend your life. I hearkened and heard, but they spake not aright. No man repented him of his wickedness, saying, What have I done? God said, I've done more than I should have done. I hearkened. I have tried to help you. I've tried to reason with you. And people have even equated this verse to the prophet. The prophet Jeremiah says, I hearkened. I've tried to speak God's word. I've tried to do everything I could to get the message across to my people. And so whether the verse is actually referring in double to God and to Jeremiah or to just God or to just Jeremiah actually has a double reference. God said, I've hearkened. I've spoke the word that I told you to come back to me. I hearkened. I listened to you when you prayed to me. And I heard, but now you're not listening to me. They spake not aright. No man repented him of his wickedness, saying, What have I done? And when we come to the Lord, we realize, What in the world have I been doing? How have I been living my life away from Christ so long? As the song says, wasted years, wasted years, oh how foolish. 
everyone turned to his course as the horse rusheth into the battle. Just going on helter-skelter, headstrong in life without any direction, being driven by sin and evil. Yea, the stork in the heaven knoweth her appointed times, and the turtle and the crane and the swallow observe the time of their coming. But my people know not the judgment of the Lord. It happens to be, at the time of this recording, the time of springtime. The birds are singing, and they're coming to their place, and they're stirring around. And Miss Peggy, my wife, she feeds the doves in the yard, and they have the seed. They come after the seed, and they flutter around, and they're getting around, stirring up. They know when it's time to come to the food. They know when it's time to go away. When it gets cold, they know how to get away. And then when it warms up, they come back into certain areas. They know their times. They know their appointed times. But you and I are going away from God as a nation, as a people. So many times we don't know our time. We don't know when it's time to get right with God. How do you say we are wise and the law of the Lord is with us? They still claimed that they had the Word of God. They still claimed they were on the right side of the Word of God. Lo, certainly in vain made he it. The pen of the scribes is in vain. God said it as though, as it were, I made the law in vain because you're not listening to what I have to say. You're not listening to my word. The wise men are ashamed. They are dismayed and taken. Lo, they have rejected the word of the Lord and what wisdom is in them. If you reject God's word, my friend, you don't have anything else to stand on. You have to stand on what does saith the Lord. And there are consequences for rejecting God's word. You cannot reject God's Word as an individual. We cannot reject it as a church, as a nation, as a country. We cannot reject God's Word and get by. There are consequences to rejecting God's Word. Verse 10, Therefore will I give their wives unto others, and their fields to them that shall inherit them. For every one from the least even unto the greatest is given to covetousness. From the prophet even unto the priest, everyone dealeth falsely. Sin had invaded every aspect of society. It had invaded the civil society. It had invaded the government, the politics, the economics. And it had even invaded, of course, the religious spectrum of society. The priest and the prophet. Nobody was exempt because sin will do you in. It doesn't have respect to person. We think about God as no respecter of persons, and certainly He is not. But He is not the only one who is not a respecter of persons. The devil is not a respecter of persons either. He'll get you no matter who you are if you allow Him. Sin will gobble you up if you let it. It has no respect to persons. It don't let you off the hook just because you're blind, just because you're lame, just because your daddy has a lot of money? No. It is there to pounce on you. And we can see it so in our day. This is so prevalent and relevant in our day. There's addiction, drug addiction. It doesn't matter who you are. You don't have to be a derelict out there in the ghetto, someone who is poor, doesn't have anything. No, you can be the richest kid on the block, and it'll still get you if you give yourself over to that. Everyone is dealing falsely, he said. I will turn your wives over to others. The judgment of God, you're judging yourselves. People say God does this and God does that. We do it to ourselves. We allow evil to come upon us because we give ourselves over to this lewd way of living. For they, and it's talking about the religious crowd now, they have healed the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. We offer a pseudo-gospel, a pseudo-message of healing when it's really not real. We try to put a band-aid on the problems of society and on our lives, and it does not work. 
God does not want us to pacify. He does not want us to put a band-aid or a bandage over our wound. He wants us to come to Him where He can heal us. He wants us to not just reform, not just rehabilitate. He wants us to repent, to repent and get right with God, change our way of living, allow Him to change our life so we can change our way of living. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush. There was a time in America when sin caused people to blush, and they were ashamed, even though they may not claim a relationship with Christ, even though they didn't go to church. They were ashamed to be caught doing things they shouldn't. But now, it seems like no one is ashamed. And he says it here in Jeremiah's day. No one was ashamed. No one was even able to blush. Therefore, shall they fall among them that fall. In the time of their visitation, they shall be cast down, saith the Lord. I will surely consume them, saith the Lord. There shall be no grapes on the vine, nor figs on the fig tree, this will affect everything. When sin invades a life, a nation, a country, a church, when sin is allowed to go on, it affects everything around, not just a person. You hear drunks talk about, oh, it don't hurt nobody but me. Yeah, it hurts everybody. It hurts your wife, hurts your husband, hurts your children, grandchildren. It hurts everyone around us. And sin in America is affecting and infecting the whole nation. Here in this situation, it affects the grapes on the vine, the figs on the tree, and the leaves shall fade, and the things that I have given them shall pass away from them. The blessings, the crops, the produce, the fruit, we see it in our day, the supply chain, the produce, every aspect of society is being infected and affected by sin. And the question then, why do we sit still? Why doesn't somebody do something? Assemble yourselves and let us enter into the defensed cities and let us be silent there. For the Lord our God hath put us to silence and given us water of gall to drink because we have sinned against the Lord. There are consequences for rejecting God's word. We looked for peace, but no good came. And for a time of health, and behold, trouble. We wanted to be healed, but we have given ourselves over to lewdness and sin, and no good came. Trouble came. The snorting of his horses was heard from Dan. The whole land trembled at the sound of the neighings of his strong ones. Dan was one of the big ones that was given into captivity because they turned themselves over to the calf and idol worship. For they are come and have devoured the land and all that is in it, the city and those that dwell therein. For behold, I will send serpents, cockatrices among you, which will not be charmed, and they shall bite you, saith the Lord. This snake, he has no pity, he has no mercy, and this is part of the judgment of God. Thank God for the new covenant that is promised. Now chapter 31, verse 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with your fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. And this is a covenant. After those days, thank God those days are past. Thank God those days, they had their place. They had the time of the fulfillment of the first covenant. The first covenant, my beloved, was not done away with. The first covenant was fulfilled. And when Hebrew said it was done away, you may take that language to say that God just did away with it. No, it was done away. He took away the first that he may establish the second. And how did he take it away? Because his son came and fulfilled it. The covenant is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. 
After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts. We have the law of God written in our inward parts today. And the reason that we can do right is because our life and our heart has been changed. God's law is not just written on tablets. It's not just written in the Bible. Thank God it is. But it's written in our inward parts. And I will write it in their hearts. We have the law of God. The Apostle Paul talks about it in the book of Romans. When we do what's right according to the law of God, the Gentiles have the law that's written in their hearts, and they do that. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. All right, know the Lord. Time to go to the temple. Time to brush your teeth. Time to wash your hands. Time to put on a mask. Time to do this. Time to do that. This new covenant, God said, you don't have to do all that. All you have to do is put your hand in the hand of the man from Galilee and let him lead you on. For they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. God said, I will do this. There's a lot of things in God's Word. He says, if you'll do this, I'll do that. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, I will. I will forgive their sin. I will heal their land. And God says here, I will forgive their sin. I will remember their iniquity, their sin no more. And what does he do? God is saying it's not because of your works. It's not because of your righteousness. It's not because of what you have attained or what you've done. God said, I will do this. I will do it of my own volition. I will do it of my own mind and heart. God is the one who reached out to us. We didn't have it in ourselves to just be good and reach up to God and say, Lord, here I am. I want to get right with God. No, God initiated he reached out to us. He reached up to us. God is the one who had something to do with us to begin with. He made the first move. He provided everything that you and I would ever need before the foundation of the world. He sent Jesus, His Son, to die on the cross for our sins. Jesus paid the price for our sins. When we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. God commended and showed forth His love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He did the first. Jesus said, You have not chosen Me, but I have chosen you and ordained you and sent you forth that you should bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. We love God, not because we love God, but because He loved us. He loved us first. We love Him because he first loved us, and He is the first one. That's why everyone needs to get right with God. You don't need to wait any longer because God has already done His part so that you could be saved and you could be blessed and you could live forever. He has already done everything that He could to make sure that you have a relationship with God, to make sure that you have a heavenly home. Jesus has gone to prepare a place for us He'll come back and get us to receive us unto Himself. And we cannot afford to be like the people of Jeremiah's day. We cannot afford to turn our back on the Word of God and simply not listen to anything God has to say. We need to turn our life over to Jesus Christ. Let Him guide and direct us. Let Him lead us. Let Him fill us with the Holy Spirit and sanctify our heart and life. We don't have to worry about this sin we don't have to worry about this punishment because all of our sin, all of our punishment was rolled over on Jesus Christ. He surely has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem Him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him, and with His stripes we are healed. He took that load of sin. He took that load of sickness upon Himself. 
Now we don't have to bear it any longer. All we have to do is turn our life over to Jesus Christ. Receive Jesus Christ today as your Savior and make Him your Lord. While you still have the opportunity, you need to do it right now today. Sin, Punishment, and Promised Restoration has been a production of Tony Broom Ministries.